First up, yeah, I thought we'll get the party pooper out of the way. Uh, Mikhail Svetlik. The title is uh, Golang versus Python and why we are losing. Don't, don't, don't shoot me. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. All right, so some, uh, yeah, I, I had to get it off my heart. Uh, like I said in my previous talk, I come from the system admin background operations, and what I see in my field is that we used a lot of Python in the past, and nowadays we switch more and more of our stuff to Go. Uh, and the reason for it is I don't think it's performance. Like, yes, Go is awesome for those uh, quick API microservices that you can just uh, do it very quickly and they're, they perform much better than uh, just stock Python. But I think one more like, contributing factor to it is how easy is it to set up your Python project on somebody's uh, laptop. So if you think about you create some awesome CLI tool in Python, now your user needs to install it. He needs to go to this world of pain of pip, virtual events, uh, Python dependencies, do I have Python 3 installed, Python 2 installed, all that good stuff. Um, and Go makes it very easy. The tool set is just awesome. You just do go, go run, go install. You create a binary. You can cross-compile it in just one command. And you can give your user um, uh, just an executable. And you're done. Uh, so this is like, I don't have really a solution. I guess I tried few solutions in the past. I tried using PyInstaller, which if anyone knows, uh, or Py2exe. So basically they create kind of like a one binary for your Python with the whole Python included inside. Um, it's not trivial. You need to work around with it. Um, and basically, you kind of like you become an expert in this to, to use it, and you don't you can't really cross compile, so you can't use Linux and create Py installer bundle for your Windows. You need to like use virtual machines, all that good stuff. Um, the other solution is just to rely on your like distribution, Linux distribution, I guess, uh, packaging, and create. Uh, create RPMs, create DEBs, uh, create uh, um, something for Mac and something for Windows. Windows don't have Python installed by default, so the game is over um, there. Um, so I guess, I don't know, I guess it's kind of like, what are you, may, maybe somebody have a better idea for me, better solution, what we can with, yes, <laughs> go. I have such a strong opinion about all this, but I don't want to have to Okay, cool. So, so please, so please come to me after this. Yes. Yes. That's that, that's a good point. Actually, containers. So, uh, not even containers. One one other option is now stuff like flat flat packs, and uh, uh, in Linux there's like snaps. Yeah, yeah. Like obviously in Linux you, you now like have five different options to do the same thing, and now they will compete for like 20 years, and nobody will win. Uh, so so yeah. So so we have another option. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the the bottom line is. Um, I think like if, if anyone here got any connections to the like Python Software Foundation, like this is like a real problem. I think that Python is losing customers and losing users because of this like packaging problem, this uh, cross compatibility problem of, of your like how hard is it to install your your awesome um, projects on somebody else's computer. So. Uh, I guess think about it, and if you have any 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 good ideas what to do, let me know, and definitely we'll catch up. Cheers, I'm I'm done. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. Um, could Ben Denham please come down to get mic'd up? Next up, we've got John Graves talking about Zappa. Serverless AWS Lambda, it's the website. Yeah. and he's put a URL in his talk title, bit.ly slash zappa17. Hamish, where are you? Hamish Campbell. 
So there's a talk to this afternoon on this whole topic, so I'm, I'm really apologetic that um, I, I might be stealing a little bit of the thunder, but a lightning talk called Zappa. I mean, how good could that be? Uh, so quickly, how many people know what AWS is? How many people know what AWS Lambda does? And how many people are familiar with Zappa? Okay, so there's a little bit of room for me to help you out with a really cool, simple tool that uh, gives you this. No permanent infrastructure. Serverless is about having systems that are there on demand. You don't have to maintain any of the infrastructure, and it really is this easy. Pip install Zappa, you've got a folder, and you're gonna Zappa in it. That gets all the permissions and um, uh, S3 buckets set up on uh, Amazon for you. Zappa deploy, you're done. You've got a Lambda function deployed on AWS, and this is what it's gonna do for you. A request comes in, it gets turned through the uh, virtual tape library. I didn't know what VTL was until I saw this slide last night. A server on the fly is created. It serves up your, your WSGI um, request, and then it dies. It's destroyed, and this all happens in 30 milliseconds. Your Python logic can be executed, implemented, and done, and then you can forget about any of the maintenance. You can fire your DevOps team, is the, is the claim. So um, I actually had a demo of this on my other laptop, but I'd like to just ask who would use a service like this? If, all right, and who has? And what have you done with it? <laughs> Is it great because it does so little or? Okay, so the, the discussions yesterday we were having was constellation of these things as uh, uh, step functions and microservices. So I think that's what the, the subject of uh, this afternoon's talk may be if you want to get into to using this approach to avoiding Docker, avoiding uh, other kinds of, of deployments. If I could just take a, the last little bit of uh, my time to um, uh, promote my uh, step-in talk uh, for, for Ned not being here, I am gonna show you something cool that you can do with uh, your bare hands computationally uh, in the See New Things in Act talk, and you can uh, uh, learn a little bit about the superpowers of big data. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Samuel Bishop, if you could come down to get mic'd up. Next up, we've got uh, Ben Denham giving us tips for Python web scraping. You got 10 seconds for those slides. Does it work? It works. Sweet. <laughs> and go. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, so I had to do some web scraping with Python this year, so I thought I'd just uh, share some practical tips I learned. Some were learned the hard way. Um, so the motivation, I needed to collect data from about 13,000 different PHP modules um, from the Drupal CMS. Um, each module required scraping uh, several web pages um, and a source code tarball I needed to do some static analysis on. And the scraping all up took about 60 hours. So um, the tips I'm showing you here really saved me a lot of that time. Um, first of all, if you don't already know about it, beautiful soup is how you can do really easy HTML parsing in Python. Um, it allows you to kind of do CSS, jQuery style selection um, of elements and scrape out data. Um, I didn't use the scrapey framework, but um, that also looks quite good. That's built on top of beautiful soup and gives you some extra stuff, so maybe have a look at that. Um, async, it's really easy to do multiple scrapings at the same time. Um, that is literally the only change you'll need to make your code, probably. Um, if you want to find out more about how to do really simple Python async, look at Grant's talk from last year. Um, that's got some really simple practical examples. But of course, if you are going to scrape multiple web pages at the same time, you should 
check the rate limits for whatever service you're going to be hammering. Um, <laughs> Um, for me, I didn't end up using this because the service I was looking at said, yeah, just please keep it on one thread. Um, also, you'll want to make your web scraper restartable. Um, you're probably going to do something like scrape 10 records, check that some of them are okay, or check that they're all okay and that you haven't missed any data or haven't had any errors. Then scrape 100 records and do the same process and incrementally look at more and more data. So, Redirecting all your output to a CSV file isn't really going to work because either A, you're going to be rewriting your entire CSV, or um, if you're appending, how do you remove the records that you're trying to reproduce that were failed before? So um, a really easy solution to this I found was just using the SQLite 3 library that comes built into Python. Um, allows you to have a single file SQL database um, that you can run SQL queries on. Um, not only does this allow you to easily find and delete subsets of the data that you want to redo, but also makes searching and aggregating your results quite easy. Um, finally, uh, next, next to finally, you'll want to log absolutely everything. Um, if you can think about it, you should log it. You'll probably want to do some kind of uh, try accept to catch every single exception, because if your program's running overnight, you don't want it to uh, fail an hour after you went to bed, wake up in the morning and nothing's been scraped. So you do want it to keep going even in the case of failure, but if you're catching exception, you should log that out somewhere and capture it. Um, and if a value can't be scraped for some reason, you'll also want to log why it can't be scraped. Um, that's gonna be saving you a lot of time. Also, if you're going to be, um, what was this? If you want to take the logs, uh, a, a collection of logs from your, um, from your scraper and pipe them out to some file. You can use the T command to get that output into the console as it's going, but you'll also want to use the standard out flush to make sure you keep all of the, um, so, you, so you can see, uh, so Python continually um, outputs things as they happen and not doesn't buffer out your output um, so that you only see things in chunks every 10 minutes. Um, finally, this is a really nice little tip. If you need to leave the house and you can't see your computer anymore and you want to be able to know when something goes wrong or something goes right, um, you can set up a free Slack account for yourself, use the Python Slack client to post messages there, install the Slack client on your phone, and you'll get free mobile notifications coming from your Python script. Um, that's quite helpful as well. Um, and with that, happy scraping. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ben. If uh, Grant, Pat, Pat and Simpson, could you go over here? Next up, uh, we've got Samuel Bishop. For those of you who've forgotten yesterday morning, uh, the title of his talk is Failing is Awesome. <laughs> Just ignore the slides, they're not mine. Um, so yeah, failing is awesome. We, we all know this. It's the foundation for success that we actually use our entire lives, right through to the underlying principle behind many things we actually aspire to. I'm sure most of us aren't completely following TDD, if we are trying, but it's red-green refactor. We're supposed to fail first. But failing in public is not usually that fun, but it's still just as useful and successful in the long term. How many people in this room have had a talk at any conference, no matter how big or small? How well did your first time go? <laughs> we, we all know the nerves and the experience can be quite surprising, but it's interesting for anyone who hasn't done a talk to take some of the feedback I've gotten. Most of the people who saw the talk fail may be thinking that it was a disaster, especially considering it happened twice. <laughs> But it wasn't a disaster, because I know that it was a good topic, because almost everyone who t gave me feedback said that it was actually something they were interested in hearing about, which means that it was something that, while challenging, was wanted. And so failing to deliver what was wanted isn't a failure to create something good, it's a failure to deliver it, which is still something that can be improved upon, which is the other half of failing, improving. Everyone likes to get better at doing things. I've never met a human being who doesn't like getting better at doing things. And so the failure is an opportunity to get much better at this. I went from knowing nothing about C++ and Unreal Engine to knowing enough that I'm patching Chromium and looking at working on database clients. It's and it been an amazing two months of learning focused around something that didn't fail at, you know, 
a good way. It failed in a way that left me fairly exposed in a public way, but I learned a lot, enough that I'm actually really excited to go and do things with what I learned. So much so that I'm hoping to actually repeat the whole presentation successfully at some point, because it, all the work has been done. Just the fact that it didn't work the time it needed to work doesn't mean that it was a complete disaster, and it doesn't mean that I can't take good things from it. So, in summary, I guess, anyone who has not yet done a presentation, stand up and try and do that, and don't be afraid of the failure. Duan Griffin, if you could come down. Next up is Grant Patton Simpson. Okay, I'm going to pronounce it asterisk comma, <laughs> where you should use it and why. I have a Okay. Um, okay, basically readability counts, which looks a bit ironic under the circumstances. <laughs> but the... Uh, but it's basically all a story about an asterisk and actually a comma. That's probably yep, readable. it's all right. You can scroll up that way. Yep, yep, that's right. All right, here we go. Here we go. This is really Python. We have a function. It's a simple function, just plots x and y and a few things. And now we use the function. Uh, we just feed in the arguments. Perfectly readable without keywords in this case, and it's nice and lightweight. I quite like that. Okay. Then, how about these? What's, what's happening here? We've got one, two, that's okay, but gray and black, which way around is it? Is one foreground, is one background, is one something else altogether? We can't tell. And even worse, we have a Boolean on the second one. Uh, what does false refer to? What has been set to false? Uh, it's not so readable anymore. Okay, so we want to change the function signature by adding the show grid parameter. We, we're ma making a library. So there it is, show grid is now false, is a default. What will happen to our existing code which uses this function? Well, something a bit mysterious, to be honest. We have the same arguments as before, but what they do is different. So we'll be wondering why the pop-out is now showing. So it's safer, in my view, to always use keywords for Booleans, unless it's blindingly obvious what it means, which is unusual. So here, for example, show pop-up equals false, we can now be sure whether there'll be a pop-up or not, assuming there's not a bug. So we digression on um, asterisk args and asterisk, asterisk, keyword, keyword arguments, quags, quags, okay. Okay, so what they do, as you may already know, or probably already know, is they conveniently gather up the arguments into variables. So there we've got positional arguments and keyword arguments, and if it was a real demonstration, you'd actually see, uh, can you read the gray at all? Yeah, okay. Okay, so that's what it does, it gathers them up. So here's how it works. Uh, I've got another example of the same function, and this time I actually um, have it intermixed. So what happens is the asterisk only gathers up what hasn't already been explicitly included. So if we have a look at the results here, run that again, we get X and Y out there, but we get the remaining positional arguments only, um, and, and so on. Now, introducing our hero, asterisk, comma. So you'll notice that I've put this, I think this is Python 3 only, so if, uh, how many people are using Python 2 at the moment mainly? Ah, oh, sad. Three, <laughs> Python 3? Yeah. Do you guys using 3 feel smug half the time? Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Much better. Okay. All right, so what happens is the asterisk gathers up all the positional arguments, and the implication is you can't have any more, and so you're only allowed keyword arguments. So what happens here? Let's test it. So we have uh, one, two. Well, that simple case still works. Doesn't require keywords for the X and Y because our asterisk came after them. But it will require keywords for all the other arguments. So for example, if I do plot one, two, and gray, I mean, what's gray? Was it the background, the foreground? That's bad. Anyway, it gives the error message that plot takes two positional arguments, but three were given, which is not entirely helpful, but it stops them in their tracks. They have to fix it as a client coder. So now we give the function what it actually wants, and uh, marker color equals red. We now know what red refers to, 
and we get success. And this is useful because we're forcing client coders of our library to write readable code. Um, and you don't, you're not forcing them to use keywords for everything, like X and Y. I think it's much smarter to allow the lightweight code. But as a library developer, I can change the position of keyword arguments or stick new ones in and so on later without breaking client code. Um, so that's really useful. OK, that's it. Uh, Benoit Chabot, if you could come down. Next up, Duan Griffin will be generating text from EBNF with Antler. Oh, it oh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. Is it, um, is it from a Mac or was it from? Uh, it's from Linux. It's a fat file system, though. Okay, should be working. Yeah, you might. Should we give up? Don't worry. Never mind about the slides. Uh, so first off, uh, seeing as I don't have slides to show you, who has heard of EBNF, Extended Bacchus Nower Form? OK, so a few of you. Uh, it's something we typically learn in computer science. Uh, so if you haven't done a CS degree, then there's no reason you would learn it. Um, it's a way to formally specify a grammar for a language, typically a programming language. So you use it for specifying the the formal specification of, uh, of programming languages, uh, and you can take uh, something that's written in EBNF, and you can use it to generate a lexer and a parser uh, for reading code written in those languages. Uh, so there was an old tool called Yak and Lex, which we used to use a lot back in the day. Uh, and now there's a newer tool called Antler, uh, which I use and, and a lot of other people use for writing parsers. And it's very nice because you can write your language specification in a high level, uh, and you don't have to worry about um, programming. You know, if the next character is in this, then we go and do that. Uh, I was going to show you what that looked like, but I can't. Um, so if you, you just have to take my word for it, that it's very nice and readable. Uh, and a lot of languages come with an EBNF description, including Python, to specify the, uh, the structure of the language. So if you can generate a parser, an Alexa, from an EBNF description, it seems to me that it should be possible to take that uh, EBNF and to generate text that conforms to that grammar. Uh, so I'm using Antler. I can take an Antler grammar file, which is effectively EBNF and some other Antler stuff stuck in there. I can generate the parser and the Alexa from that, and I can take them and use them to generate text, hopefully. Uh, I'd like to do this to generate uh, text for test cases. So I'm writing a parser, and uh, I want to generate weird test cases that I wouldn't come up with and uh, basically um, fuzz my, uh, my parser. So I'm writing a utility to do that. Uh, it, I kind of got it working a couple of days ago, so hence I'm talking about it now. Uh, I, f I think it's going to be quite useful. Um, I need to extend it to uh, generate more interesting test cases, uh, maybe choosing which branch to take when, when following the grammar rules uh, based on some metric uh, that's more interesting than random choice. Uh, so that's something we need to, I need to look at and improve. Um, potentially maybe trying to get something that's not semantically valid, but semantically more interesting than just randomness by possibly allowing hooks for users to make a smarter choice for things like identifier rules, which are high-level rules, which you may want to um, not just completely blindly choose items for. Uh, but yeah, with all that, hopefully we'll have something which will generate uh, test case input, uh, and we can use that for stressing and, and fuzz testing parsers. So I've think that will be useful for me. Maybe it will be useful for some of you or some other people. Um, when the t code is a bit tidier and a bit more bug-free, hopefully, uh, I'll put it out there. And anybody who's interested, uh, come and talk to me about it later. Thank you. Uh, Clinton? Oh, yeah. Two more talks to go. 
By the way, someone wrote on the whiteboard talk request. If async IO, why twisted? Who's that? <laughs> What's it? Is that what you want to hear? I see. You were like the last one to put something on the whiteboard, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so next up, that'll be interesting to pack into five minutes. Yep. Continuous integration and continuous deployment with GitLab by um, Benoit Chabot. So, quick question. Who uses CI CD at work? Okay. Who is using CI CD for their own small website? Three. Okay. Nearly nobody. So normally with this talk, you'll be able to do it for your small website. So continuous integration and continuous delivery uh, with GitLab. GitLab is like GitHub for those that doesn't know it. It also includes Travis or Jenkins and Docker Hub all in one website. Um, Git is the starting point. A commit will trigger a pipeline. Uh, first stage will build the Docker container. Second stage will test. Third stage will tag the Docker container, and fourth stage will release. Uh, Web UI looks like this um, with all your stages. Uh, when you have a failure, you have a big red, red cross. Uh, if it's all good, it's all green. So GitLab uses um, a pipeline in YAML. So you just need to define a YAML file, which is a dot, uh, dot .gitlab.ci.yaml uh, in your folder, and it will start to run a pipeline for you. You list your stages, you define your variables with environment variables, you can get, keep secrets on the GitLab side. Uh, you script the stages, and then you enjoy all your pipeline. So for the build, you have to log in Docker, you rebuild an image, and you push your image. It's super simple, it's like 15 lines of code to just create your own build with Docker. For your tests, it's even easier. You create a SH script in your Docker container. In my case, it's running coverage manage.py tests. You fail if one test fail. You expose your coverage reports uh, with the artifacts inside GitLab. Um, that's how it will look for a pull request. Uh, you can see that there is a coverage percentage, so you can even check uh, with a regex what is your coverage percentage. 84%, not too bad. Um, then the, the thing is, if your tests are all OK, what you want to do is release your image. So you'll pull your latest image, you'll tag it, and then you'll push it to the internal repository. You want to deploy. Uh, very simple. You have a script on your web server uh, on a subdomain that would accept um, a curl command that will then trigger a SH script on your small server and uh, would release uh, your entire stack. So in my case with Docker, it's using Docker Compose behind the scene. Yeah, we had a talk yesterday. It's very close to what we saw yesterday. And uh, the curl command is just running uh, Docker Compose uh, um, restart. Uh, how much does it going to cost you? Nothing. The private Git repo is free with GitLab. Uh, you have one gig of Docker images for free. You have 1,000 minutes per month of build pipeline for free. You can also install your own um, like GitLab runner on your own servers if you want to, and then you have an unlimited amount of uh, build pipelines. And the entire code base is around 80 lines of YAML and 20 lines of bash script to be able to release all of this. So now you have no excuse. You know what to do next weekend. Nice. Thank you, Benoit. The last lightning talk for the day will be by Clinton Roy, who wants us all to come to Australia for PyCon and for linux.conf.au. That's pretty much the talk. <laughs> um, so, hands up everyone who's from New Zealand. 
Right. I did not put my hand up because I'm from Australia, if you haven't worked that out yet. So you, sh <laughs> you should return the favour by coming to some of the conferences that I'm going to be helping, uh, that I'm going to be attending and helping running back in Australia. Um, the first is in a very few short weeks, uh, Linux ConfAU. Um, it's going to be at the end of January in Sydney. Um, there are two days of mini comps. I'm helping to put on one of those mini comps. And then it's three days of low level uh, Linux stuff, so kernel and uh, low level user library stuff. Um, it's all based around free software. Um, I think this year is going to be like my 17th LCA that I've attended. Um, and I'm on part of the team that's putting in a bid to run it in a slightly nicer location down the Gold Coast in 2020. Oops. Uh, later on in the year, uh, PyCon Australia. Um, I'm not involved in running this one at all. I've been involved in running the last four in Australia and I am giving myself a break. Um, so we have three days of your regular conference with talks and tutorials, and then we have two days of coding sprints where everyone who's come to the conference gets together in a room and works on whatever project they're interested in. Um, both of these things are in Sydney. Um, I, can't, I can't help that, um, but I can uh, move some of the conferences to the Gold Coast eventually. So um, thank you all for um, helping to put on uh, this lovely conference this weekend, and I hope you'll all join me at some point in Australia in the future. Thank you. So before.